Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone. Welcome uh, students at our professional program and the public. Welcome panelists and moderators. Thank you so much for being here. Today we're doing a webinar panel on uh, the topic of strengthening nonprofit foundations relationships, a funder's perspective. So this webinar today is actually um, part of a, of a larger professional program that we offer through um, UC Berkeley Extension. My name is Dusty Ann North, and I'm the instructor for the for the, I'm the lead instructor for the professional program. Um, and I'm just uh, thrilled to host one of our favorite parts of our course today, and super excited that uh, UC Berkeley Extension decided to make this piece public because it is one of our uh, one of our feature highlights of the course, and it's so wonderful to be able to offer it to a larger audience. It's such a critical topic and also a good chance for folks in the world to know more about our professional program and maybe consider coming or sending a staff person to in the future. Um, I want to say a couple uh, things about our course. Um, it is, as I mentioned, it's the professional program in fundraising and volunteer management offered through UC Berkeley. And uh, we offer it once or twice a year, depending on a variety of factors. It's a 30 hour course in terms of class time. And it's for nonprofit and public sector staff, board members um, <clears throat> who want to learn more about capacity building for uh, organizations. And it is designed to be for folks that are directly connected to a nonprofit so that the course is both professional development for the participant and capacity building for the organization. So we do a lot of real time uh, work that actually uh, moves the organization along in its fundraising and its volunteer management efforts. Um, students do a final project that is an actual real product that moves their organization along in some way. And we have an amazing faculty of presenters who are all hands-on, very cutting edge practitioners. Um, we also have an advisor program where each uh, participant is able to benefit from the guidance of an expert in fundraising or volunteer management, um, et cetera. So it's a very comprehensive, helpful program, especially for small and medium sized nonprofits or public departments that are finding they have to do additional fundraising. So we really encourage folks to consider attending. We have organizations that send staff and then send a different staff the next year. This this time we have two repeat participants. I haven't had that before. I thought that was an especially high compliment. So it seems to be a really popular and valuable course. So we, we uh, encourage folks to know about that and there's more information about it in the chat. Um, and so more about today's panel. This is where we have traditionally invited uh, grant officers from a couple of foundations. We do different foundations each time to really share their perspectives on, um, on foundation funding, how to build a relationship with a foundation and steward that relationship. And also, of course, what makes effective proposals and what kind of reporting they want to see and all the ins and outs of having a, a positive, healthy relationship with a foundation. So uh, folks have traditionally found this to be incredibly useful to hear directly from from uh, funders' own perspectives. With that, what I would love to do is introduce our moderator for the panel, who's then going to introduce our panelists. And our moderate, our excuse me, moderator today is uh, Carolo Aparicio, who has been one of our faculty for the program since we started in 2016. He's the annual giving officer for the Bay Area Leads Fund at the San Francisco Foundation. He's led uh, a variety of fundraising efforts at organizations, including, but not limited to, Grid Alternatives, Sierra Club, Global Fund for Women, EcoViva, and Ash International Rivers. He earned a master's degree in anthropology from Vanderbilt and his MBA from San Francisco State, which is also where he got his BA. And he is a certified fundraising executive and a frequent invited lecturer and workshop facilitator on fund development and nonprofit management. Carollo is not only a wonderful um, faculty member for our course, but also usually serves as an advisor and he's doing so this semester as well. And he's on our advisory board because he's such a powerhouse. So with that, I am, and uh, nothing but thrilled to hand it off to uh, Carollo, who will introduce our esteemed guests. Thank you so much, Ken and Eduardo, for being here. We're so pleased to have you. And thanks to the Extension team for putting this all together and making sure we know how to push the right buttons. And welcome, everyone. Thank you. Destian, thank you so much for the um, for the warm welcome. I really, really appreciate it. 
And thank you so much, Eduardo and Kenneth, for, for joining us. So let me say um, a few words about, about you guys and your, your background. So um, Eduardo Gonzalez, um, he's one of my colleagues at the, at the San Francisco Foundation. Um, he's the Multicultural Fellow of the Power Pathway, and I think that's probably going to beg a little bit of explanation as to what that's all about, but we can, we can get to that. Um, Eduardo has more than 10 years of uh, organizing and power building experience in the uh, in the Bay Area, and his work is focused on BIPOC communities, including youth um, and education justice efforts. So Lalo was born and raised in the Coachella Valley, and I think that that's where you're calling us from today, aren't you? Yep. <laughs> and um, he's engaged in community change efforts as uh, as a youth and throughout their professional career in the nonprofit sector. So Lalo has shifted into philanthropy. Um, to learn more about philanthropy's role in um, uh, building community power through the lens of racial equity. So you can read more about, um, about Lalo's interests and such on um, his bio from um, the Eventbrite, um, Eventbrite page that, that was shared. Um, Kenneth, um, and am I pronouncing your last name correct? Kutchman? Kutchman. Cushman uh, is the executive director of the Bernard um, E. and Alba Witkin Charitable Foundation um, based in Berkeley, California. So formerly, um, Kenneth was the vice president of PKF Consulting, which is a nationwide consulting firm based in San Francisco that specializes in all aspects of real estate analysis um, in the hotel and lodging industry. And I think we're going to have an interesting conversation about maybe the the career shift that that happened there. So we can we can touch on that. Um, he has an MBA from the Peter F. Drucker uh, Graduate Management Center of Claremont Graduate University, a Bachelor of, of Science from the School of Hotel Administration at Cornell, uh, and an AS degree from the Hotel and Restaurant Department um, from City College of San Francisco. He's a board member of the YMCA of the East Bay um, and a board member of Volunteering for Oakland and is a member of the advisory board for the UC Botanical Garden at UC Berkeley. Um, you are, he's also a state certified real estate appraiser in California, Oregon, Washington, and is an affiliate member of the Appraisal Institute. So I wanna welcome you today and, and thank you for, for taking the time to, um, to speak with us today and share about um, about your work in um, in philanthropy and um, just to to share your your wisdom with um, with me with uh, with each other and with uh, the folks who are joining us uh, by Zoom. So I'm going to start off with uh, with a question about um, the foundations that each of you work for. Um, tell just tell me a little bit about the foundations that you work for. What are the priorities and what what sort of change are you striving to make in the community, communities that you serve and the, the world in general? So Lalo, why don't, why don't we start with you? Great, hi, um, thank you Carlo for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak today. We're looking forward to the conversation and also always in a learning learning mode. So we're really excited to hear more about Kenneth's perspectives um, as we engage in, in dialogue today. Uh, so again, uh, my name is Eduardo or Lalo Gonzalez. My pronouns are he and they. Um, and as Carlo mentioned, I am the Power uh, Fellow with the San Francisco Foundation. And the San Francisco Foundation, uh, we're a foundation based out in San Francisco that serves the um, five counties in the Bay Area. So that includes uh, Marin, San Francisco, San Mateo, Contra Costa, and Alameda County. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're a community foundation um, and we are really committed to advancing racial equity and economic inclusion to really ensure that everyone in the Bay um, the Bay Area has a chance to get a good job, live in a safe and affordable home, and also have a strong political voice. And so it's kind of like the vision that we have um, for the Bay Area and you know, across the US, since we know that you know, Bay Area and a lot of these issues are, are not just specific to certain communities, but very connected in regional, statewide, and just national-wide kind of um, issues. Um, my role specifically is with the Power Pathway. Um, and so, in the San Francisco Foundation, a uh, large amount of our grant making comes from three different pathways, as we call them, people, place, and power. 
And so I'm housing the power pathway where we really lean into that last point I made around um, having community have a strong political voice. And so that means uh, you know, supporting efforts like community and youth and gen intergenerational organizing, um, power building, which really means centering the voice of the most marginalized folks um, across the Bay Area to really empower them to make community change, whether that's through local policy, um, you know, county policy, is, it may be through like the um, education system, right, depending on what the need is. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm excited. Um, um, Part of the multicultural fellowship is bringing folks in from that aren't traditionally in philanthropy to learn more about philanthropy and get engaged and um, be in this kind of like learning journey to understand, you know, what are other ways that philanthropy can partner with a nonprofit and other other um, sectors um, to not just provide grants and funding, but also be a thought partner um, in um, helping uh, be part of the solutions um, to some of our issues out here in the Bay Area. I'm excited to share more a little bit. Excited to share more about that, you know, as the conversation goes, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lalo. Um, so, Kenneth, same same question for you. Tell me a little bit about the about the Whitkin Foundation and its priorities, and the sort of change that you're striving to um, to make in in the community at large and the just in in the world and the the people that you serve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Paula. I uh, appreciate your moderating today, and Paula, it's nice to be on the same panel with you. Uh, the Bernard E. and Alba Whitkin Charitable Foundation focuses on the East Bay area of San Francisco, Alameda County, and San Francisco County. Uh, Bernard E. Whitkin uh, was a UC Berkeley grad, both uh, undergrad and law school, lived most of his life in Berkeley. So when he and Alba Whitkin started the Whitkin Foundation in the early 1980s, they decided to focus on the East Bay. And uh, over the years, the focus of the foundation has really uh, come to focus on programs that work with kids. Um, so we fund uh, a wide variety of programs that work with kids. We feel our dollars go the farthest with programs that help the youngest kids. So that would indicate we, uh, our support for preschools, uh, mental health uh, programs for young children, shelters that take care of uh, families with kids, um, clinics and, and medical programs that uh, serve uh, um, young families and, and young children. At the other end of the kid age spectrum, we also uh, fund a number of programs that work with foster kids. In this case, sort of kids birth through five being launched to kindergarten. This would be transition age foster youth uh, aging out of the foster care system being launched to adulthood. So we fund a number of programs that uh, provide uh, housing, uh, job uh, readiness, and college preparedness for those youth. And in between those age brackets in elementary schools in the East Bay, we fund a lot of enrichment programs, academic enrichment programs, uh, having to do with literacy, art, music, uh, movement, and then additionally, we have um, a small basket of programs that we fund in the area of uh, peace, nonviolence, and restorative justice. Uh, I think um, in essence, uh, the, the Whitkin Foundation focuses on what can we do to help young children and their families to get kids uh, educated and literate and launched uh, to be stronger members of our East Bay uh, community. Uh, we don't uh, try to tackle what would be un unsolvable problems of homelessness or, or particular medical uh, issues or societal changes, we really focus on kids and how uh, promoting a better life for kids will lead to a better outcome for our uh, society with stronger adults in the future. Uh, just by way of size, uh, uh, we fund about 100 programs annually in, in the East Bay, and some programs are in San Francisco and Marin but they have an East Bay focus uh, and we dispersed last year about $1.8 million. Great, thank you so much, Kenneth. Ke Kenneth, um, I'm not gonna let you off the hook just yet. Um, as we mentioned a little little while ago in talking about your, um, your, your bio, you've had a really interesting career and before coming to philanthropy, you know, can, can you set the stage a little bit about you know how you became involved in in philanthropy and and then right. how the how your your life experiences um, inform your approach to the the job of of, of working in philanthropy? Yeah, sure. Um, in a nutshell, I, I grew up in Sacramento, and my family used to come down to San Francisco when I was growing up, and I got very interested in San Francisco history, and as a result, uh, the hotel industry because of the, the notable Palace Hotel, which uh, formed a significant part of San Francisco history years and years ago. And uh, so, as you mentioned, uh, I got a degree in, in hotel administration and um, 
uh, had a pretty good career in the hotel industry. All that, all that was going on, my, my father had passed away and my mother, uh, Alba Cushman, um, uh, married uh, Bernie Whitkin. So uh, Bernie Whitkin was my stepfather, Alba Whitkin uh, was my mother. And um, they, as I mentioned, formed the Whitkin Foundation. Uh, Bernie Whitkin passed away in 1995. And before my mother passed away in 2014, I saw that the Whitkin Foundation had the uh, legs to continue uh, functioning for the foreseeable future and somebody needed to take over after my mother was no longer able to do so. So I decided to step in. And so that, that's the transition that, that you noted uh, from, from one industry to another. But I will say that um, one of the things that's unique about the Whitkin Foundation is we're often one of the few funders that goes out and actually uh, sees programs and uh, inspects the uh, program sites and talks to the folks uh, who are running the program on site, looking at the at the buildings and the site and the program in, in, in its situation. And so all the uh, real estate uh, inspections that I had done over the years and all the analysis of hotels had it helps me a lot in that, as well as all the detailed uh, financial analysis that I had to do in my prior career <clears throat> helps a lot in my analysis of, of how uh, nonprofits are running. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, Eduardo, same same question for you. Um, I mean, you've also have um, have had some experiences before coming to work at a at a foundation. Um, I mean, how what made you decide to um, to explore philanthropy as a, you know as, as as a as a shift in your career and how have your experiences um, informed your approach to um, to philanthropy and to to the work that you do? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, so for me, I um, as I as Carlo mentioned, I grew up in the Coachella Valley, which I'm calling from now. Um, better be reconnecting with family for the weekend. Um, so before joining philanthropy, I actually came from the nonprofit world. So um, definitely have a lot of that experience of navigating, you know, what it's like working with different funders from government funders, philanthropic funders, community foundations, private foundations. And so um, I definitely come with that experience of thinking about my role as a um, funder when it comes to um, grant making. Um, with that experience of the nonprofit, you know, I also, you know, experience what many have already experienced currently and, you know, throughout folks' journey around like turnover, you know, trying to balance and meet funder expectations and trying to balance those expectations with community needs and like staff needs. Um, and also just, you know, balancing those kind of different expectations that come from, from different, you know, sources. And so with that in mind, I really lean into my value of humility when thinking about connecting with um, grantees, potential partners, um, potential folks that we want to um, connect with. Because I definitely understand that, you know, organizations are not always going to be at 100% just given turnover, given capacity, um, and really remembering my time in the nonprofit and, you know, reflecting on the challenges that I face, you know, communicating with funders and just having that grace whenever I am able to connect with uh, potential or current grantees about, you know, the work that's going on. Um, I think the last thing for me is I, since I come from nonprofit work, a lot of it is thinking about, um, in my case, I was thinking about the young people as those are the people that we're accountable to, making sure that we are meeting their needs um, and just community in general. And so what I also think, um, you know, being in a community foundation is that aside of like our, our board of trustees and um, our leadership, our community is a huge kind of like um, accountability that we need to respect and always be listening to. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think for me, it's really putting on my cap of like, you know, what are the issues um, navigating the nonprofit world and how can I can like shift some of those kind of like struggles or, you know, power dynamics that may exist that way. Um, there is a, a good relationship and, you know, a, a healthy way to really communicate um, and support and really listen to what um, nonprofits or folks on the ground are, are sharing the needs are. Thanks, Lalo. And um, we got a couple of questions that, that came in and um, from um, JD, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your last name, um, Leza. So the question is, how are your foundations overcoming the grow the growing wealth and income equity between fundraisers and program staff within the agencies that you fund? 
uh, I wasn't quite sure where those professional fundraisers uh, who are uh, raising money for um, nonprofits. <clears throat> and I think that one of the big concerns, though, and I think one of the things that leads to um, <clears throat> the challenges that both the San Francisco Foundation, I believe, and the Whitkin Foundation Fund are the, the issues that come up uh, for folks who are struggling to make ends meet. Uh, the income disparity uh, uh, in, in, in society is one issue. And then also, too, uh, within uh, nonprofit programs in, in general, um, just by their very nature. And unfortunately, um, many folks in who work for nonprofits are, are paid salaries that are at the lower end of the, the pay spectrum, yet they're doing extremely valuable um, work uh, that, you know, that leads to uh, better outcomes for, for humans. It's hard to put a value on that. So I, I think all of the nonprofits that, that we fund are are working real hard wherever possible to increase the salaries of their staff for a couple of reasons. One, because of the expense of living in the Bay Area, and two, because it's probably the right thing to do. And three, because literally uh, you need to try to hang on to staff right now because they're uh, hiring new staff is challenging because people who are looking for jobs are looking for higher salaries because they, they know about these issues. So I think um, there is that, that conundrum there that uh, uh, just about all organizations, and I believe also private businesses are wrestling with that now. Yeah, yes, thank you, Lalo. The only thing that I'll add is specific to the San Francisco Foundation is that you know we've kind of shifted to doing project specific grants, to doing more general operating grants. That way, you know, folks have the opportunity to be flexible of how they want to use those funds, and we've kind of like increased our kind of like minimum grants um, to our now our, our minimum grants are starting at seventy five thousand dollars. Just to respond to that, you know, we're understanding that there's been a lot of turnover in the nonprofit sector. And so, like, you know, Kenneth said, it's kind of hard to fill and retain staff. Um, and so our hopes is, you know, with our minimum 75K of general operating that, you know, folks are able to really meet that need and, you know, fill in those gaps um, to re retain the the um, folks that are working in, in their organizations. Mm -hmm. I think Lalo made a really good point, and it's something that Whitkin's done for a long time. You mentioned San Francisco Foundation does it, and I've heard other funders talking about being more comfortable to make unrestricted donations. And I think it really is a wise thing because if you if you bring aboard a nonprofit uh, that you're going to fund, you've obviously vetted that you have a, a, a sense of confidence that that organization is performing well. It might be better to trust the leaders of that nonprofit how to best spend the money that you give them rather than for the, the funder to direct, well, it has to be used for this specific person or that specific specific purpose. And sometimes um, nonprofits can run into the issue where they don't have the ability to spend all the money on that issue that they're, they're given. So we almost always give an unrestricted donation and allow uh, the folks in charge to decide how the money's best spent, whether that be for salaries, for example, as we're talking about now, or, or maybe to invest in the building or, or some other need. Thank you. And JD had a had another question, and I'm not quite sure if I'm if I'm getting the the gist of the the question right. But the, the question reads: Does the over concentration of wealth inside too big to fail investment funds and foundations undermine the impacts and outcomes your foundations are working to achieve? So, yeah, I, I, I looked at that question. I thought, again, I couldn't quite figure it out, but. One thing that made me think of, uh, no, this is um, <clears throat> what was being talked about, is there's a, a lot of money tied up in donor advised funds. And um, <clears throat> whereas for direct foundations like the San Francisco Foundation, we can, we can look at the money that we have available and decide how we want to have it spent. Donor, donor advised funds, um, you know, they're waiting for opportunities to come out about, or they're waiting for folks to advise them on how that money should be spent. And in, in some cases, not as much money as is available as being uh, to the community. Um, I, I couldn't quite uh, uh, get on the question what, what too big to fail meant. Uh, I don't think that our work is being undermined. Lala, do you have any sense of any uh, uh, any competition, so to speak? No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I th I think that one of the one of the issues that has been raised around you know, in investments and foundations and such is um, um, the argument that the that large, the big philanthropy can sort of um, be anti-democratic 
and it can you know create its own sort of policies and priorities and sort of crowd out the the democratic process in terms of um addressing societal societal ills so you know i'm wondering if maybe that's what what jd was was alluding to and and getting at with with that and i'm wondering if you have any comments on on that sort of thinking well um one um thing that came along in, in tandem with the pandemic uh was a lot more focus uh, uh because of all the issues that came up in society during the pandemic era of, of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I, I can stay without fear of successful contradiction that every nonprofit organization has, has some sort of EBI uh, committee or some new EBI lens or, or way of looking at things. So I think that um, uh, things got shaken up quite a bit. And I think there's a lot more interest and focus on equity, and, and allowing folks who haven't been to the table before to make their voices and thoughts known and to really think about how previously marginalized or unheard uh, community members can actually have some really great and, and uh, su suggestions and, and advice for how money should be best spent in the community to make things work. Yeah, definitely. And then I'll just add that, you know, at least for the San Francisco Foundation, um, you know, racial equity has always been kind of like in the forefront of thinking about and just social justice in general. And so appreciate um, more, at least coming, you know, as I mentioned, you know, coming from the nonprofit world, that word or that kind of investment wasn't as explicit before. And so I do appreciate that there has been that shift of um, just foundations, uh, philanthropy in general, you know, wanting to invest in, in really, you know, um, centering the marginalized folks, centering folks that oftentimes don't have a seat in the table to then help inform, you know, what are the gaps, what are the needs um, to you know, kind of get to the problem solving around the issues in the Bay Area. So, yeah, that'd be the only kind of a note to make. That's great. So, um, thank you so much for for those questions, J JD. I think those they were they were really thought provoking. Um, so, uh, um, another question that came in from Avis Jenkins. So as a fledgling nonprofit organization, do you have any suggestions or advice for approaching funders for startups or capacity building funds when you have limited data? And I'm assuming that's limited data about what, what the organization is doing uh, because of your status as a new group. So you're you're starting from, from zero, you haven't tested a, a project yet, and you are seeking funding for, for this. That's a really good question. Um, Whit Whitkin historically has been, been willing to kind of start at the ground floor with um, nonprofits that are just starting out. And um, uh, I think you have, I think the, my advice to, to the person who asked the question would be uh, to have a really clear um, idea of what is exactly it is that you're going to do. And if you're looking for potential funders, you might look at, at where you expect to be in a year or two and then look at other organizations that are in that space and go to their annual report and look and see who's funding them. And uh, I guess the, the extension would be, well, if they are willing to uh, fund that organization that's doing that thing, they might be willing to start out with you with the expectation that you'll get to that place. Yeah, totally. And the other thing I'll add is, I think partnerships are, are very valuable. And so just going off that last piece that Kenneth shared around, you know, looking for organizations that do similar work, I'd also encourage you to build some kind of relationship with them um, because I feel like oftentimes that can help just, you know, um, learn from one another, right, of nonprofits, but also um, part of kind of what we ask in the San Francisco Foundation is like, what are the community partnerships that you have, community relationships, like how are you rooted in the community and or other kind of like folks in, in the ecosystem that you're trying to work work with. And so I think having, um, having those kinds of just like connections and, um, you know, your partnerships are can also be very valuable and, you know, you don't have the data, but you have the kind of those connections that are already doing that work. And so I think that will also add a lot of value to kind of like the um, connecting with funders and potentially getting some seed funding to kind of launch your project. And I'm, I'm just going to pipe in from ex experience that, that I've had that sometimes that that is the case you are starting something that's completely new you don't have data and what you are seeking funding for is for a pilot project and you you couch your proposal in terms of um 
in terms of piloting um, something, you're, you're, you're experimenting and there, you're going to have to do your research to, to find a funder that's willing to take those, those sorts of chances with, uh, with, with a pilot project. And, and I think too, um, if you're looking for funding and you get the opportunity to talk to a funder, don't be disappointed if that funder turns you down, but take that as an opportunity to ask that potential funder, hey, can you please suggest two or three other folks that you know uh, that I might be able to contact? And then in that sense, then you would soon, soon be sort of networking uh, everybody if you always make sure to ask for other suggestions, even if somebody's not able to help you with dollars. So getting getting into the, the nitty gritty, I think, um, both of you have read a lot of proposals in your in your experience. Um, so, what are some of the things that make for make for strong proposals? And can you share with um, with with our audience um, any thoughts on you know what might weaken a proposal, and um, <laughs> and, and your favorite pet peeve <laughs> on around proposals that maybe you know don't don't quite cut it. I can I can start with that one. I think for me, um, where I've seen in strong proposals is folks that really understand, you know, one's role as an organization, right? Like, what what lane are you in 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 the organization? You know, there may be other organizations that do similar work to you, but what what makes your organization either unique or different or like specific about the kind of work, populations, geography that you're covering? Um, for example, you know, it could be it's a specific community, either geographical or ethnic. Um, and and so, yeah, so I think it's like, like knowing knowing your role and knowing kind of like where you are in, in your lane. Um, you know, do you, are you a convener? Do you, are you, do you do advocacy, the direct services? And just being clear about, you know, your role and contribution to kind of like, you know, what you're trying to solve. Um, and I think the other thing that makes it a strong proposal for me is just, you know, being just explicit, right? Oftentimes, you know, nonprofits do a lot of things. And so sometimes folks can get lost in like a lot of the different ways that the organization is, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. But um, oftentimes some, some um, funds have very specific and explicit criteria. And so really being explicit about how this project connects directly with, with the criteria that's being looked at um, or just the general like mission of the foundation. I um, sometimes uh, marvel at the um, uh, proposals I get where they've gotten to do spell check or don't check names. Uh, that's uh, remarkable to me. Or sometimes in, uh, the document won't be scanned correctly, so it'll be a little out of alignment. So, but I, I try to usually look past, uh, you know, uh, things like that. But it, it's too bad when that happens. Um, I also think it's remarkable too when you have a website and folks can go to the website and see what your foundation is about and see what you're focused on and see what your interests are when you get a proposal that doesn't address that. It's sort of like you uh, kind of uh, have wasted your time there because that's not something that you would be interested to fund yet. I still have to take the time to respond back to you. Um, I, I also find uh, well, what can tends to fund, as I mentioned earlier, organizations uh, year after year once we bring them. Uh, an organization on board, as long as we still feel confident that the organization is functioning well and, and doing a great job, we'll entertain a, f a funding proposal year after year. So that's one of the reasons why we're able to handle so many organizations uh, every year is because we don't have a lot of turnover. For example, the Berkeley Public Education uh, Fund, we've been funding every year since 1985. But uh, one thing I find remarkable in, in subsequent proposals is that an organization will just ask for more money. Say, if you gave them 10,000 last year, they asked for 20. Okay, 20, all right, well, why not 30 or 50? There's Oftentimes there's no analysis or, or justification given there. So I, I, I um, feel that as funders, it's our job to get money out. There's no reason that we can't talk about money. There's no reason that you can't ask for money. But there has to be a, a logic and, and, and a reason behind that. Well, why should we double our donation? Uh, if we're still funding, um, why can't we give the same amount that you find more funders, for example? But I think you have to demonstrate either there's, there's a changed need or that, you, or that you have been successful and brought on five additional funders, but you need additional funding still because of uh, this growth uh, uh, of, of your organization and this change in having to increase salaries or, or change in demand for your services. 
I think there needs to be a little bit more explanation of what we need sometimes. No, that that completely makes sense. I mean, there has to be some sort of a rationale um, ex explaining why the the in the increase in um, in the request for funding. That makes a lot of sense. Well, something that you said um, sparked the thought around. Um, there's a lot of foundations that tell you that they are not accepting unsolicited um, proposals. That's that's a pretty it's a pretty normal thing. And it's the foundation's role and the and the program officer's role to move money into um, into community and into into causes. Um, so there there can be a little bit of a disconnect there, right? You know, because there's some interesting work that's going on, but they don't yet have access to you. I mean, how do how do we how do we bridge that that gap of you know not accepting unsolicited proposals, um, but somehow learning about some interesting projects that might be very relevant to uh, the type of body of work that that you're doing. So do you have any advice in how folks can sort of bridge that gap and and get these new ideas in, in front of in front of program officers that might be receptive? Whitkin doesn't have that stipulation. We'll, we'll look at um, anything that comes in. I, I hope that doesn't mean that after this <laughs> presentation today that I'll get a bunch of Get ready for your uh, inbox yeah. to blow up. But but uh, you know, every, every once in a while, I'll be I'll be talking with one of the organizations that we're we're funding, and they'll say, "Gee, you know, we're really looking to increase our our donor base. Can you suggest some foundations that I might apply to?" And I say, "Well, how about this one or that one?" Oh, well, these are great ideas, Ken, but they they don't accept uh, unsolicited proposals. So you have to it has to be generated from them. So that's a hard question to answer. I, I think one way that you could, as a as a development person. Uh, approach this would be by networking, by attending certain events, you know, where you're likely to run into to, uh, uh, folks from organizations. There are a number of funders groups um, that if you could get yourself out in front of, like, for example, I belong to Richmond Community Funders, Contra Costa County Funders, uh, Early Childhood Funders. Um, you know, there'd be a way to get in front of those funders groups. That would be good. Also, uh, for, I think you're involved with the uh, Association of Fundraising Professionals. They have a really great um, National Philanthropy Day every November uh, in San Francisco, which is really a who's who of the philanthropy industry, both folks who are um, making money available and both folks who are soliciting funds. So that type of a setup uh, where you could get into a, a conference or, or get together or a gathering of, of fundraising folks or, uh, or foundations. Uh, uh, or even non, non, other nonprofits, I think, is a great uh, opportunity. That's great Net networking. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that that's definitely key. Lalo, do you have do you have any insights into um, you know how folks can can do something to bridge bridge that gap in a way that's that's respectful, but that's also um, proactive? Yeah, totally. I, um, so for the San Francisco Foundation, our our general grant making right now is invitational only. We do have you know a couple. Um, Funding opportunities, one being the rapid response fund, which I'm happy to share on chat. Uh, open cycle, always accepting applications and grants range from three to twenty thousand um, dollars. So, our for our general operating grants, though, um, those seventy five k that I mentioned are invitational only. And so, the way that um, I've seen kind of folks approach is um, sometimes it's it's either a connection from someone from another foundation, how Kenneth mentioned, right, it's making those connections or just doing a uh, attempt and doing an email of like, hey, I'd love to connect with you, hear more about, you know, what your foundation priorities are, um, and, you know, also see what are the opportunities for funding. Oftentimes, you know, foundations may not be as explicit about how decisions are made, and so I think being a community foundation, right, we, as I mentioned, you know, we have a responsibility to respond to community, and so at least folks in the San Francisco foundations are always open to share, you know, how our process works, um, and also, you know, being just responsive, right, um, about just how we can get more funds out in the door. Um, the thing I'll, I'll also know in, in networking, right, is not just about asking for the grant, but it's, the other thing that I want to note is that um, a lot of foundations and foundation staff have like a you know thirty thousand kind of foot view of the landscape in the Bay Area, and so if it's if it's not like a grant request, it's maybe just thinking about you know any connections or you know what are folks seeing in in the field, you know what are some strategies that are working, right? Some kind of like landscape 
analysis that can be through conversation. Um, another kind of like approach would be doing like, you know, what will educate with philanthropy, right? Doing some of that relationship building of, you know, folks, you know, do enjoy talking about themselves and like the work that they're doing. And so partying in a space where, you know, you can share at a, you know, person to person level of like, you know, here's what brings me to the work, you know, what are your values? Like, why are you in this role? That way there is that kind of sense of like, you know, uh, connection um, and doesn't, it is not just about, you know, where can I get the money, but really thinking about what are the other ways that I can connect to um, other partners or you can connect me to other opportunities. Um, and, and yeah, just double down on what Ken said about the networking piece as well, trying to um, go to different events, um, that that may be public um that foundations or other philanthropic kind of institutions are putting together um and you know starting those relations um those conversations there um to kind of you know get your your um face and kind of like connection yeah well let's let's go a little deeper into um into that and um talk about develop developing these these sorts of relationships i mean both of you you're you're, you're both real people um, within within institutions, and that's one of the things that I want to that I want to drive um, through in all of this is that you know foundations aren't like these nameless, faceless monoliths. There's real, living, breathing human beings that that are that are working working for them, and um, who genuinely want to do um, a good job by by their organizations and by their by their communities. Um, so. What I'm wondering is, you've brought up relationships and sparking these these relationships and conversations. And um, do you have any advice on how fundraisers can go about um, starting and building these relationships with uh, with foundation officers, and um, you know what what that could look like. Well, I, I think it, uh, you, you might just want to start with some of the brass tacks. You know, always have a business card available. Uh, always remember who you give your business card to. Uh, if there is any logical reason that there would be a follow-up, send an email or, or the next day. Um, if you promise to do something, make sure that you do that. Um, you know, maybe make a tickler file, um, and maybe the person that you uh, that you're trying to develop a relationship mentioned that something would be happening at a certain point and you know, at that date and you have to find out if it's going on or if you didn't participate. Um, sometimes too, you you might have an opportunity you know, like the, at an event to learn something personal about that person. Uh, maybe they have a dog and you have a dog or or maybe they have kids and you have kids or, or something that you can, you know, without without being anything improper, you know, develop a, a relationship, you have some commonality or a uh, person that you meet might say, oh, I'm, I'm really trying to figure out where's the best place to, to go for this or that, or the best place to, to buy this or that. And you think, oh, I have a really good idea. And you might send them something and, and you kind of you know, develop something a little more than just about the organization. You also show them that you have an interest in them and that you're dependable and that, that you follow up on, on things that you say. Yeah, totally. The other couple of things I'll add is, um... Just inviting folks to events that you might have putting on, like the nonprofit has, for example, it has a, a mixer or if it has, you know, a, a gala or something, either like a community kind of presentation, right? That's open to the community. Always inviting program staff that you may um, already build those relationships with in terms of like follow up, right? You maybe have a conversation a few months later, you'll say, hey, there's this opportunity. I'd love for you to come and, you know, check out the work that we're doing. Um, so just you know, inviting either program officers or just program staff to events that your organizations might be putting on. That way, they get you know um, just different perspectives of, of the work that you're doing. Um, I think what's really helpful as well for me is that I've seen folks do is um, with that follow up email. Oftentimes, it's like a one pager that kind of summarizes. Here's kind of like the key points, or here's kind of like what the the work that we're doing, just to kind of like have it at hand. Um, because a no now might mean a yes later. And so that way that just gives a, you know, some kind of material and, you know, keeps um, folks top of mind for the next kind of like cycle um, that folks can refer to. Ideally, they'll know the follow up and be like, hey, let's engage again. Um, but if not, that's another chance for you to be like, all right, maybe in six months from now, I can follow up, see if there's any other opportunities that came up or a year from now. 
Um, and just having that like that one pager that kind of summarizes the notes or you know the work is just you know super helpful for um, for um, at least for me and other program staff. That's great. Thank thank you so much. Um, a little while ago, a, a question came in from Lily, um, asking about, um, and I, I think this question is actually a little bit more appropriate for um, uh, develop other development professionals, but. But I think I think you might be able to provide some some insights into it also. But um, where can you find success in tapping into wealth in the Bay Area? You know, and to to network and begin this sort of donor relationship. And I think that you've already, Kenneth, especially you've already touched on it with um, uh, donor forums and and um, events events like that. Um, do you think you could say a little a little bit more about other other opportunities for? networking and accessing um, wealth within within the Bay Area? Uh, well, I, I think that that's, that's really the, the name of the game is to identify um, those um, uh, organizations that are have the funds available and, and, and can constantly work towards um, getting yourself a foot in the door, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, I think also, um, you don't necessarily always have to uh, go for the biggest organizations in order to be successful in, in raising funds. Um, I remember um, talking to one executive director years ago as a mental health organization uh, for children, and I said, well, you know, I really don't know if you need uh, Whitkin to fund. You, you seem to have so many other funders. And she said, yeah, but here, here, turn the page and look at our annual report. Look at how many individual funders we have. So, you know, any any one funder uh, is not, uh, it, it could be small if you want to think about it that way, but if I couple together all of these funders, then I will really accomplish something. So uh, you, you might not want to be disappointed if you can't get a huge donation from, from one organization, but you're really successful in, in putting together a number of smaller donations from smaller, perhaps more approachable organizations for, for your particular nonprofit. That's good advice. Not any any insights from from your experience in working, you know, working with nonprofits as as you have before, or um, conversations that maybe you've had with uh, with develop development folks. Yeah, at least I think, um, like I mentioned, and going back to this whole like importance of relationships, I think that carries a lot of weight. At least from what I've seen, oftentimes. Um, at least for like donor advice funds or other kind of like donor relationships, right? A lot of that isn't as explicit as our general grant making. And so staff within foundations usually have more of an understanding of how to navigate that. And, and you know, staff within foundations talk to one another. And so I think that's why it's really important to just build, build relationships outside of just a grant, but really thinking about, you know, who you are as individuals, who you are, like your larger vision. Um, because then that's, I've seen that, you know, a program officer can definitely um, kind of like make a connection to a donor um, and they might be like, you know, not planned. It just might be like, oh, here's an opportunity. Do y'all know of any organizations? And so um, program officers may be like, oh, I just talked to these organizations or here are some orgs that come top to mind. And that's really how how some of those connections have, have been made um, for at least, you know, the donor advice funds. And I think uh, sometimes you have to split the work up. Um, uh, as you mentioned, I'm on the advisory board for the UC uh, Botanical Garden at Berkeley. We're right now um, uh, currently looking to hire uh, a new development director and also an associate development director. And the thought is that the development director will focus on really big uh, grants and large single donations from, from either grantees or, or corporations. And the associate um, development director will focus more on individual giving uh, because it's not really the 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 way that you approach uh, both sources of funding is completely different. Uh, you know whether you're cultivating individual relationships with you know, you know um, donors that have the ability to make uh, significant donations, or, or whether you're focusing on some really big stuff that that will carry through for a few years. Uh, so I think you may have to uh, kind of uh, make sure you your priorities, you know what your priorities are and you're going for one or the other. It's challenging, I think, to try to do both. That's really great. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and do a shameless plug for the the, the UC Berkeley um, program in, in uh, 
uh, fundraising and and uh, volunteer management. This topic that was or the question that was raised a little while ago around um, networking and connecting to uh, to donors. That, that's a big topic in um, in the program um, around the whole sort of uh, donor cycle from um, um, identifying all all the way to cultivating the relationship, making the ask, stewarding the relationship, and learning more about the about the the donor's network and interests. So this is um, a topic that we really really focus on um, in the program and. Uh, yeah, so that was just a, a shameless plug for the program and um, somehow feels appropriate. Um, so another another question came in around uh, thoughts on determining how many asks are appropriate and, you know, too much or too little and can specific asks hurt larger ones. And I'm, I, I'm not sure if the person is getting at uh, the number of asks or the ask amount for um, for a donation or um, or a grant, um, but can we comment a little bit generally on? Um, oh, there we go. Clarification. Yeah, the the number of asks to um, to a foundation. I mean, how how many bites at the apple does a does a um, uh, a potential grantee get? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll um, uh, say that, you know, if, if I get a uh, request for funding and I spend the time to look at the organization and uh, we decline to fund, um, I, I probably wouldn't consider funding that organization again, even if they were to ask again, unless something significant had, had changed. Um, um, we'll fund any organization that we're currently funding annually, as long as we're asked. Uh, we, gen we generally don't reach out to solicit funding requests. On that other question, um, uh, sometimes we'll have organizations that that will say, well, you know, we, we, we'd like to continue our program funding, but I, we also would like you to consider a capital donation. But we're concerned if we ask for both that you might turn down both because we're asking for too much. And so I, I you know, in that in that sense, uh, I, I, then you fall back on what, something else we've been talking about, which is your relationship and your understanding of each other. I, I should hope that uh, that, that wouldn't uh, be a problem. I, I do, and I think, Carla, what you're alluding to, maybe I, I do sense from time to time that there is sort of this apprehension or fear from funders to, to you know, not be confrontational, that's not the right word, but be very direct. With with funders, and I think it's okay to be very direct. You know, why why can't you be? Because you're, you're like I said earlier, one person is in the position of overseeing the disbursement of funds, and one person is in charge of the solicitation of funds. There's no reason you can't have an honest and direct uh, discussion with them. I think that's I think that's really healthy, and I think that it's a way of sort of addressing that sort of power dynamic that that we often see and, and think about between funder and, and grantee. It could be sort of an asymmetric relationship, but the way that you talk about it, Kenneth, is just having open, frank conversation and each one bringing something to the to the equation and that can do something about leveling that that playing field and making things a little bit a little bit more more equitable and equal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd also say going to that um, first point that Kenneth was sharing around, you know, you first get declined and also about the directiveness. I think it's always appropriate to ask for feedback about declines just to understand, you know, what was one help you, you know, maybe, you know, shift language or know that it's not like a good fit and um, ask for other connections. Um, but also just gives an opportunity for more of that opportunity to connect and, you know, build relationship. Again, like that, that no now may be a yes later down the road. Um, but I always encourage folks to to ask for feedback um, and in like the proposal or like a, the, the thinking around the, the decision. Because um, I feel that it definitely is a responsibility for, you know, foundations who have that information um, to try to be like uh, transparent about uh, the, the decision making. Um, and then, I mean, just in general, the response to Stephen's question, I, I don't think, uh, you know, there's, I don't think there's too much um, of, a, of an ask personally. Um, I think I will note that, you know, even if we do have this wealth, right, we still have limited resources that we give on an annual basis. And so, fortunately, we can't solve all the issues and fund all the organizations. Um, so it never hurts to ask. 
I definitely just encourage you to ask, um, especially if it's something that's like very urgent, timely, that is, is you know, um, critical um, and unanticipated, right, of that your organization might be facing. It might not mean getting resources there from that specific foundation, but it may mean making connections to another foundation or other staff that then the program officer can do personally. And that definitely has a higher chance of you, you know, one, having a conversation with them, but ideally also getting some funding. Um, so again, I think it just ties back down to that relationship and thinking about, you know, you know, we're also human, right? Let's let's humanize one another. That we're just we're not, we're not just like a you know people with with um all these resources. But we're also kind of like do appreciate you know having those those connections. Um, that way you also feel you know you can come up to us or you can you know approach us um without that fear or that kind of like oh I don't want this to jeopardize any future funding. So Lalo, you've you've um you've touched on this a little a little bit, um with regards to the rapid response fund. Um, do you wanna just say a few words words about that? Because it might be yeah. something that would be of interest to the, the folks on the on the call. Yeah, totally, yeah, thank you for that, Carolo. Um, so the rapid response fund is, as I mentioned early on, it's uh, one of our uh, funding opportunities that's open year round um, and accepts applications. Our goal is to, um, I really have, we have two kind of like criteria that we really, lean on, which is uh, is a centering movement and power building. So really centering marginalized communities and uh, empowering them to make change in their community. And is it responding to a catalyzing event that happened in your community that was unanticipated and you need additional resources uh, to respond to that need? It's a project grant, so it has a ideally has a six month lifespan. It's not meant to you know support ongoing um, general campaigns but it's really meant to respond to something immediate that was unanticipated from your organization. Uh, you know, we have a, a, a committee of five different staff that review the application, uh, make recommendations to fund, uh, and the grant is, again, between $3,000 to $20,000. And I can pull the link and send it on the chat. Um, and, you know, we have, like, what we fund and what we don't fund. And so definitely pay attention to, like, what we don't fund because, we're really explicit, you know, that it's a very specific funding opportunity. Uh, and so, yeah, I definitely encourage you all to check it out and reach out uh, if you have any questions um, or any support that's needed for that. Thanks, Adel. Um, So most of the folks who are, are on the call are um, development professionals um, in of one, one sort or another. And I'm wondering if you could provide them with um, some sort of a, advice or some insights into um, into your jobs. And is there something that you would want them to understand about about you and and your role in um, in your in the in your foundation? I'll, I'll answer that question this way. I, I think as a as a fundraising professional, um, one of the things that that I think is really important in your approach to a foundation is to be able to um, provide numbers and statistics uh, uh, for what what you're asking for funding for. Um, it's kind of hard to fund in, entirely something based on, on, on gut feel, uh, although we're, we're not opposed to doing that. It, it's And I think also too, maybe not so much for the Witkin Foundation, but for other foundations, numbers and statistics, things that you can point to, are very, very important. So I think the more factual data that you can incorporate into your communication uh, really strengthens your case versus uh, just saying that uh, saying this or that. Uh, I think that that's, that's an important thing. Um, uh, and I think that also too, I think as 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 there's a lot of turnover in foundations and funders groups that would therefore imply some of the, the folks who are newer or maybe are less sure about you know, uh, making a decision. But if they see that it's backed up by numbers and facts and figures, says, oh, okay, that makes sense to me. I, I may not have the experience to either know whether or not I can make a bit gut judgment, but I can look at make a factual judgment and think that this is okay to think. I think what I'll add is that, you know, as I mentioned, there's there are limited, you know, resources. And answering the, the question was around like, um, what you hope folks understood about our, our job kind of thing. Okay, great. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I, I just mentioned that, you know, I in well, one, you know, 
folks in foundations, you know, as I mentioned, you know, are human and may have our may have uh, used the resources that you're offering. And so um, just know that, right, that they're actual real people with experiences um, reading the application. And so oftentimes decisions are hard and oftentimes the decision is because there are limited amount of resources uh, versus it's a reflection of the merit of your work. So that's, that's the one thing I want to know. Um, you know, in an ideal world, right, we want to fund everything, but that's just not realistic. And part of a community foundation is to stay here for a long time and make sure that we are able to support the organizations that are responding uh, to the needs of community, especially, you know, the nonprofit is such an important sector that really oftentimes fills the gaps that the government or the education sector cannot fill. And so definitely is a valuable kind of like, you know, um, resource and investment. Um, so I think that the other thing I add is that, you know, saying no is hard. And so, mm -hmm. and I had just having grace that, you know, when I'm asking for feedback and with the opportunity, you know, hopefully it's not a, a you know, a, they call it a, it's a good, right? It's a, it's a fruitful, it's a helpful conversation where fo both folks are, I'm sure there'll be disappointment, right? But there's opportunity for folks to be heard. Um, but also understand that, you know, it's not a reflection of you're not doing good enough, but it's more about like, we can now. And so there's just a limited amount of resources that we can give. Um, and how can, you know, you use that to then, you know, circle back a few months after that um, to see if there's any other opportunities um, or again, you know, connections that they can make of, you know, you read our proposal, you have an idea of what we do. Are there any other folks that you know of that you can personally connect me to that you think will be interested in, in supporting something like this? Mm -hmm. That's great. So I'm just looking at the at the time. I mean, where where is it where is it gone? <laughs> um, but I, I want I want to get one one last question in about um, trends in philanthropy, and you know, as you look into your your magic eight ball, um, you know, what sort of what sort of future trends do you see in philanthropy, and what what sort of advice would you have for fundraisers to sort of navigate? Um, those trends? I think a trend um, that I'm seeing, um, that I'm excited about that is being more, I'm seeing more um, that I didn't see when I was in the nonprofit world is kind of this trend that's been going on for a while, but it's called like trust-based trust philanthropy, uh, which is, you know, a practice that has, you know, values that are rooted in advancing equity, shifting power, and just building mutually accountable relationships. And so, you know, it'd be great for folks to just understand what that is and really push for foundations to kind of steer in that direction. That way, you know, it does call for more, you know, multi-year general operational grants, you know, more leaning into the relationships versus the transactional um, and really humanizing the work that folks are doing. Uh, I think it's an uh, exciting kind of like shift in philanthropy, specifically for like community foundations, private foundations. Um, corporate foundations, you know, have you know, different kind of approaches to the work, but at least for, for you know, community foundations and family private foundations, you know, there definitely is more flexibility and um, a commitment and accountability to the community. Um, so definitely check it out. You know, there's a website to learn more about it. Um, and also, you know, lean in those values and, you know, I'd say approach when you are connecting with um, different uh, funders, you know, with those values in mind. Um, and hopefully, you know, that you see those values mirrored um, and yeah, I'll pause there. Yeah, I, I would say that Lolo is completely up to date and completely switched on to all of the current trends. So I, I really don't have anything significant to add to what he just summarized. I th think there's an excellent uh, a summary of, of um, where things are, are, are shifting to right now. So I, I did want to ask ask one just really quick question. If um... If you could give us a couple of books or media or you know things that you're reading, things that you're learning about um, that you want to point other folks to, and um, and share that with them as we close. Well, I I get hundreds of emails every week, so I spend a lot of time reading emails from all the organizations that that we support. So that's the, so I don't often read uh, uh, for leisure, but I am reading one really interesting book called Torn Apart. It's written by uh, Professor Dorothy Roberts of the University of Pennsylvania. And in a nutshell, she's talking about the child welfare system in the United States and how discriminatory it is for people of color. And her contention is that the system is so broken, it can't be fixed. It needs to be completely replaced by 
uh, another system. And I think I find that to be fascinating. Thank you. Lalo? Yeah, for me, it's um, Beyonce's album, Renaissance. I'm just kidding. Um, I think for me, uh, one book that I, that I read and I'm coming back to is Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. It's an incredible book. Um, Self-help, you know, society help, planet help kind of book uh, that really helps us helps me think about, you know, the future we want, how do we show up as individuals and go with the flow versus trying to always be in, like, you know, in content station and um, great tools as well to reflect and apply to facilitation to your work that I found super um, useful. And a book that I want to read that maybe we can start a book club after this um, Miss Solidarity Economics by Dr. Manuel Pastor that has been mentioned a lot. Um, that really talks about, you know, just narrative shit about thinking about our economy versus the economy and how, you know, folks definitely have a control I mean, power over, over our economy, right? And just shifting that language. And so excited to dive deeper into that. Um, so check it out if, if you haven't. There's also a website um, that, you know, you can get the book for free um, with, I think there's also like a comic that has a kind of like a, some visuals to it as well. Oh, we should definitely do that in a, in a future book club. That sounds fantastic. Well, I want to thank you both um, so much for, for your time and for, for your insights and for, you know, addressing questions from, from the audience. You, you guys were fantastic. I really, really appreciate you. And um, I think I want to um, open it up to Desian, who's going to, um, who's going to close the, the program. So thanks again. And I, I really appreciate both of you. Thank, Thank you, you. Carlo. Thank you very much. Thank you all three. Carola, thank you so much for moderating such an incredibly useful, specific, yet also very varied and, and rich discussion. And Kenneth and Eduardo, we couldn't be more pleased to have uh, gotten to a little window inside those good brains of yours and your experience. Thank you so much, really helpful. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick things I wanted to highlight. Um, I, what I love about this panel is how it do, is how it really kind of demystifies that relationship that nonprofits and other providers can have with foundations. We're all here to do the work together, and there's this hesitation. And I think just by being in the room with all of you, people feel like, oh, I get it. I can reach out, and it's it, I don't have to put something in. Hope I get an answer. And if I didn't get the answer I wanted, do I put in again? Don't I? We have a conversation, right? So thank you for that. And. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that a lot of the things discussed today are themes that we delve into much more detail about in our 30 hour course, of course. Um, and when they come up in the funder panel, it's always such a good, first of all, complimentary perspective on things that we're discussing, sometimes more from the provider side, um, and also kind of confirmation that these are important themes, no matter which angle you're looking at it from. So that's always a big takeaway from, for me on um, these, so thank you. And I think most importantly, one of our biggest themes in the course is about relationship building with everyone, with the community, with the donors, with volunteers, um, et cetera. And that just really came through today. So I just really wanna appreciate those big points. There were many other specific points that were wonderful. But again, thank you, um, Carollo, for such an incredible job. Eduardo, so nice to meet you and, and get to learn a little bit more about you. You're a wonderful addition to folks that we've uh, gotten to hear from before. Kenneth, um, wanted to thank you as well. We've known you for a long time, and I meant to say at the beginning of the course that this semester is actually funded by Ken's Foundation, the Whitkin Foundation, and we're just so grateful for their, they've been a funder since the very beginning, and they've been, as you can see today, not only a generous supporter, but an active participant. Kenneth has always been very generous with his time and sharing his thoughts with our students and the public, and so we just really value this relationship and are so glad to have you. And thanks to the Extension team, this went so great. I felt so supported. I hope our panelists and moderator did as well. Thank you, audience, for coming, students in the course and outside folks. It's been wonderful to connect with everyone. If you're new to us, please check out our 30-hour course and consider taking it. No matter who you are, please stay in touch. Please spread the word about the work we're doing here. And thank you again for participating. <laughs>